Hey everybody, it's your AP Bio teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are finishing, yes, we are finishing our second unit on cell structure and function by discussing the compartmentalization of eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Um, and we're also going to get into how eukaryotic cells became compartmentalized and what exactly compartmentalization means. Um, so let's get into it. Look, we're kind of start, we're kind of finishing where we started here, discussing the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We really went full circle. Thank you for going on this journey of the cell structure and function with me. Um, anyway, um, so prokaryotic cells, as we should know by now, um, is that no, uh, they have no membrane-bound organelles. Everything just kind of floats around um, within the, like, say, bacterial cell or archaean cell. Um, and eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, which is a membrane-bound organelle that, you know, contains DNA. Um, and they got a whole bunch of other membrane-bound organelles that we studied over the course of this unit, like, say, mitochondrion, chloroplast, uh, lysosome, peroxisome, vacuoles, all that kind of stuff. Um, so eukaryotes have these special membrane-bound organelles, and prokaryotes don't. Um, so we would consider what we, uh, what we call eukaryotes to be compartmentalized, uh, meaning that, you know, different, different functions happen in different parts of the cell, and they're all separated out by a cell membrane. It's really nicely kind of, it's kind of like organized, right? So um, maybe this is a bad comparison, but a eukaryote is somebody that has all their files, you know, labeled and color-coded and and put into a neat file cabinet. While, you know, prokaryotes, just, they just kind of have their stuff all over the place. And there's some organization, some compartmentalization, but they're not separated out by membranes. Um, so eukaryotes are really, you know, they're meticulous and they have everything organized. Um, and this comes as an advantage to eukaryotes, um, simply, simply because there's different enzymatic reactions that happen in different parts of the cell and they, otherwise they don't interfere with each other and they don't compete with each other. Um, and they don't have to compete for the same uh, surface area, okay? So the other thing that um, is a benefit about having membrane-bound organelles and being very compartmentalized is that there's more surface area, um, means more areas where reactions can occur within a cell. So again, remember talking about, and I believe that was topic 2.3, where we discussed how an increased surface area allows for more reactions to occur or more exchange with the internal external environment okay so if you're a cell and you've got tons of membranes and you've got tons of surface area on the inside of the cell that means you have a lot of area for interaction and lots of areas for reactions um, so it's really advantageous for your eukaryotes to have all these extra membranes within its within within the cell um, so it's very, again, compartmentalized. It's organized, and you've got a lot of areas and a lot of surface area for reactions. Um, so as I said before, prokaryotes don't have organelles that are separated by membranes, but they do have um, specialized structures. So if you take a look at our diagram over here, we still have a protein capsule. We still have a cell wall. We still have um, nucleoids, which are, you know, it's, it's semi-compressed DNA. It's not all put together in a nice package in the nucleus. Uh, we still have ribosomes, right? So they have specialized structures, but they don't, they aren't separated out by membranes. It's just kind of like in there, into, into the cytoplasm or into the cytosol. And they're much less compartmentalized than eukaryotes. Um, so there's a reason for why eukaryotes became so compartmentalized. Um, so how did that happen? Well, in reality here, um, as I put up here, prokaryotes have been around on Earth for, you know, they're, the very first living cells uh, were prokaryotes. And really, all scientists believe it was, it was just a phospholipid bilayer that kind of surrounded some self-replicating RNA. And that's really it. That's all you really need for, for it to be a living thing. Uh, so by definition, the first cells, the first living things on planet Earth were prokaryotes. And they were, you know, the dominant life form. They were the only life form for about a billion years before eukaryotes evolved. So how exactly did cells become eukaryotes? How did they become compartmentalized? Um, and there's actually an excellent theory on this. And I would just like to uh, take a moment to get on my soapbox and talk about the word theory. A theory isn't just somebody's guess. It's not just you know, oh, I have a theory that, blah, blah, blah. like, no, a theory is a well-substantiated, well-supported explanation of a natural phenomenon. 
right? So this, uh, and then the key word here is explanation. So a theory tends to explain things, okay? So evolution is a law, but evolution by natural selection is a theory. And natural selection explains how evolution occurs, right? So and a theory is an explanation. Endosymbiont theory explains how eukaryotes evolved. Um, and what this is, endosymbiont or endosymbiosis theory states that an early ancestor of eukaryotic cells engulfed an oxygen using non-photosynthetic prokaryotic cell. So what the heck does that mean? Well, it basically means that one cell, an ancient prokaryote, kind of used some phagocytosis, kind of used some endocytosis to form a vesicle around um, another prokaryotic cell, particularly one that used oxygen to produce ATP through aerobic respiration. Hey, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Um, so let's take a look at this picture here. Um, and this is kind of a very, very brief um, overview of what endosymbiosis is all about, or endosymbiont theory. Um, so here we've got our ancestral prokaryote, one of the you know first organisms that lived on planet Earth. Um, and in order to allow that uh, the nucleus to form, it had kind of had an infolding of the plasma membrane. As we know, the plasma membrane is very fluid, and it can form different shapes and form different bubbles, and it can be very you know convoluted and folded. Um, so with, what the theory states is that you know the nucleus formed by forming simply a membrane around the uh, the nucleus. Um, but the part that we really want to discuss here is that the endosymbiont, endosymbiont theory really involves taking this aerobic bacterium, another completely separate prokaryote, another completely separate organism, engulfing it through phagocytosis, and then basically becoming one organism and living together with this smaller aerobic prokaryote inside of the, of the larger prokaryote. All right, so symbiosis, you might have heard of this before, like symbiosis is um, where two different species of organisms, uh, where, where they have a influence on each other, where they live together, right? So you might have heard of like mutualism or parasitism or commensalism, something like that in a previous science class. Um, but symbiosis is when two organisms of different species live together, right? And endosymbiosis, endo means within. So this is literally one organism living within another one. Um, and this is how uh, eukaryotes evolved. It was through one swallowing up another one and making it, you know, produce ATP through aerobic respiration for it. So as I put down here, this host cell and what's called the endosymbiont, the engulfed cell, merge into one organism. And that oxygen-using um, aerobic respirating organism eventually evolved into the mitochondrion. And the same thing happened for the chloroplast, right? So a, an early cyanobacteria, it's called, as you can see here, cyanobacterium are these prokaryotic cells that are able to photosynthesize. Um, what happened was, you know, an ancestral eukaryote, I'm not saying it happened at the same time here as this diagram suggests, but it's the same thing. A ancient prokaryote used phagocytosis to engulf a photosynthetic cyanobacterium and made the cyanobacterium, the engulfed cell, produce some sugar, produce some glucose through photosynthesis for it, um, and thus evolved the first photosynthetic eukaryotic cell. Um, so that's pretty, pretty crazy um, that eukaryotes, you know, evolved from just taking in another cell, right? So that is how, you know, eukaryo eukaryotic cells came to be. Um, so endosymbiont theory is well supported. It's well supported. It's a well-established scientific theory um, as mitochondria and chloroplasts. What is the evidence? Woo. What is the evidence that we have to support this? Well, all we have to do is look at um, the characteristics of mitochondria and chloroplasts. And I've alluded several times um, that mitochondria and chloroplasts, they're kind of weird um, in comparison to other organelles. They have two membranes. They have an internal membrane and an external membrane. So where did that internal membrane come from? Well, the internal membrane was probably the original membrane of the bacterium when it lived outside of the cell. All right, and then through phagocytosis by that bigger cell taking it in, it formed another membrane around it. Thus, it has two membranes um, that has an internal and external membrane. And guess what? Mitochondria and chloroplasts have two membranes. Um, mitochondria and chloroplasts also have their own, wow, this is a mess. 
Uh, they also have their own ribosomes, and they also have their own multiple circular DNA molecules. Um, so these are very indicative of bacteria. Bacteria, as we just found out, prokaryotes have their own ribosomes, and they have their own uh, DNA molecules, much like mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts. And in fact, um, the way DNA is typically found in prokaryotes is are in these circular kind of molecules. So it's not compressed like it is um, in a nucleus. In eukaryotes, it's kind of like in a circle shape. And guess what? Mitochondria and chloroplasts have that, again, indicating that they were once their own separate organisms. And finally, mitochondria and chloroplasts are autonomous, and they can reproduce on their own. They have their own DNA. They have their own ribosomes. They can live independently, um, and they, they can also reproduce and split on their own without, uh, without any help from the rest of the cell. So these are all huge indicators that mitochondria and chloroplasts, or ancient mitochondria and chloroplasts, are descended from uh, these other completely separate organisms that got engulfed by a larger one. Um, so this is how eukaryotes evolved, and this is how eukaryotes became compartmentalized. And clearly, it's advantageous for those reasons I stated before. You have more surface area to do these reactions, and you're keeping your reactions, your enzymatic reactions, separated out from one another within the cell. All right, really cool stuff. So I apologize if I rambled a little bit, but uh, I'm, I like this stuff. This is cool. All right. Um, so that's it for unit two. We're going to get on to unit three, starting uh, with our next video. So it's going to be sweet. All right. Bye, everybody. Let me know if you have any questions.